Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. So great to have all of you here. Thanks for stopping by, JMS and Lovely Hall. Hope you're having a good day today. And we're going to put some smiles on your faces because we've got somebody who is very, very, very talented in so many different aspects of entertainment. And uh, he's a very inspirational person along the way as well. I'm talking about our friend John Tesh is joining us here on the Gym Master Show Live Series. It's a real honor to have him here. Now, John and I were just chatting uh, sort of backstage off air. Uh, I had an opportunity to interview him uh, several years back now. I can't believe when you look at the calendar, everything goes by in a New York Minute. Uh, on a PBS special he did where it was uh, filmed at Red Rocks in Colorado, and it was uh, an incredibly well-received John Tesh music concert special at Red Rocks. And I just remember the phones ringing off the hook at PBS, people loving that special. And that's where we first met when I interviewed him on PBS. He's one of the nicest guys on the planet. He's a straight shooter, he's authentic, he's real. And he's, as, as I said, he's multi-talented in so many different areas. He's mastered so many different areas as well, but he's done it with depth and impact. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about his work and why people resonate with him. John Tesh, again, one of those people that really stands out for me as a broadcaster because he started out as a television broadcaster. He's been a television personality for a long time, a radio host, but also an extraordinary pianist and composer, musician, multi-Emmy winning uh, performer and Grammy nominated performer, and also somebody who's just about to embark on a fantastic Christmas tour. Uh, so make sure we'll tell you how you can get your tickets and things of that nature for his Christmas tour. If you've never seen him perform, if you've never had an opportunity to pick up some of his music, I can tell you right now, every piece of music he's put out, every CD, which goes back many years, um, we have it all in the collection. And it's really good stuff, uh, you know, from pop music to contemporary Christian and, and classical and weaving it all in together. His Christmas music is fantastic. His pop cover tunes are terrific. His uh, contemporary Christian music is absolutely spectacular. So make sure you do uh, run out and get your copies. He's also not just a phenomenal musician, television reader, personality, and so much more. Uh, he's a brilliant author, too, and he's authored couple of wonderful books, of course, Intelligence for Your Life and Relentless. This is another fantastic one. We're going to talk about all of this as well. And as I mentioned, he started out in television. There he is. This is going back to around 1979, 1978. Those of you in the New York Tri-State area remember him on Channel 2 News, WCBS TV. This goes back to the days of Michelle Marsh, Rollins Smith, Jim Jensen, all of the incredible greats. Uh, but he's also worked at other television stations as well. Interesting story he'll share with us about how he ended up on television, working in the building where Walter Cronkite worked and all these uh, New York television legends as well. He's worked in sports uh, for NBC News as a correspondent. He's written award-winning music used in the Olympics. Of course, as we know, uh, for a number of years, he had an opportunity to work on Entertainment Tonight with the iconic Mary Hart, and uh, that was an incredible period of his life, but he's done so much more than, uh, than that as well. He's interviewed all the celebrities. He's had an opportunity to uh, you know, be in your homes every night, five nights a week on Entertainment Night for a long time. But uh, while doing that, he was doing his music, and he also launched this very popular series, syndicated series on radio. I'm sure you've heard it. It's an incredible incredible series. Uh, we've got it in our car. We've got it in our home. The John Tesh Radio Show, Music and Intelligence for Your Life, syndicated on somewhere over 400 stations nationwide, and it's been on for a long time. There's a wonderful podcast, of course, Intelligence for Your Life as well. Yes, this is really, really terrific. With John Tesh, Connie Selica, his beautiful wife, and uh, Gib Gerard as well. They're together in this podcast. If you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, again, he's been married to the lovely Connie Selica since uh, 1992. They have a lovely daughter, uh, Prima, as well. 
And uh, again, he's an iconic figure in American television, radio, music, and so much more. But he also, um, he's a motion, motivational speaker. He's an inspirational person on so many different levels. And he's been very open about experiences in his own life which I think is extraordinary. We'll tap into that with the time we have with him. John Tesh was born in New York on Long Island. Many of you know that's where I hail from. He was born in the wonderful uh, city of a garden city on Long Island and his mom a nurse and father textile chemist. And um, really fascinating story about his time in Garden City, uh, making inventions in the basement. <laughs> Some really incredible stories he's gonna share. American pianist and composer of pop music, radio host, television presenter, contemporary Christian classical, hosting, again, Intelligence for Your Life, the radio show, and since 2014, hosting Intelligence for Your Life, also TV with Connie Selica. He's won six Emmys, four gold albums, two Grammy nominations, an Associated Press Award for investigative journalism. He sold over 8 million records, live concerts raised more than 7 million for PBS. He wrote the NBA on NBC basketball theme, Round Ball Rock. Again, as I mentioned, hosted the television program Entertainment Tonight, previously worked as a sportscaster for the Olympic Games, Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, the Tour de France, Ironman Triathlon, and also as a news anchor and reporter. And in uh, 2018, he was inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame. Uh, he studied physics and chemistry at North Carolina State, took television and radio courses. I'll let him tell you more about it because it's a real fascinating story. Worked at several stations from Nashville to Orlando to WCBS-TV in New York. And again, he's uh, had an opportunity to also appear in The Icarus Factor, an episode of Star Trek, The Next Generation. He played a Klingon warrior who also appeared as himself, the 1987 episode of the daytime serial soap opera Santa Barbara as well. His mu musical career is extraordinary. And again, I encourage you folks, if you ever have a chance to catch him in concert or just you know, go to Spotify, iTunes, download his music, get the music on Amazon as well. He's really, really, really a talented guy. And he's humble about it too. I remember the first time uh, in the studio, people were coming up to him. Oh my God, John Tess, John Tess, I see on ET and all this other. He's very, very humble. And he's very grateful for all of the blessings that have come his way. And that's one of the things I really love about a guy like John Tesh in one of the most demanding, unpredictable industries uh, out there, radio, television, music, uh, doing it all and doing it with love and faith and understanding of uh, the human spirit. So it's really cool and a tremendous honor. You know, I, you guys, I've been very excited about having him here. And with this uh, tour coming up, I really do. And those phone lines were cooking that night. <laughs> I think you uh, bowled over PBS. They didn't realize the response that was going to happen. <laughs> well, I certainly didn't. Um, you know, it was a that whole thing. The Red Rocks show was such a huge risk for me and my wife Connie. And um, you know, I, I <laughs> as you know, it's a long story, but I'll try and I'll try and keep it short. You know, it was basically uh, I wanted to my whole life. I grew up as a musician, you know, and I ended up in physics and chemistry and radio and television, sort of by accident. And I always wanted to be considered a you know full time touring musician and and when i saw the moody blues on uh on pbs and i saw yanni and i saw the three tenors i i i called up pbs and i said hey i i can do one of these and they're like well you know nobody are you touring at all and i said no and they said well what are you gonna do read the celebrity birthdays with the uh, colorado <laughs> symphony orchestra and i said that's very funny but no and they said well if you make it if you make the show uh then we'll we'll T test it maybe but uh, we can't we can't invest in it you know you're not the three tenors and so the right. fact that uh, a woman who i still stay in touch with linda taggart at maryland public television the fact that she i sent her a vhs of a rough cup of, a rough cut of the show and the fact that she tested it at midnight and and it ended up raising a bunch of money she's like i think you've got something here yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> but if that hadn't happened it would have been a whole different story you have an extraordinary story about how you ended up in the same building as Walter Cronkite at WCBS TV Channel 2. But before that, it sounds growing up on Long Island, you grew up in Garden City. I was born in Mineola and then we grew up further out east in Suffolk. Um, 
you were in the basement. You were always creating things and inventing things. You did plays. You uh, were doing the little news reporter thing. I, I would walk around with the Panasonic cassette recorder, the microphone, and interview all the relatives and the neighborhood yeah. kids. Yeah. Sounds like you were already sort of thinking about a few things you wanted to do early on in that basement and beyond, huh, in Garden City? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you bring this uh, this up and what your life was like. And Mineola was like, uh, you know, it's funny when you're like eight, 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 ten years old, Garden City is like a stone's throw from Mineola. But it was like, no, it's across the tracks. We don't go there. And the Mineola kids don't come. You know, you were, you were one, of the, one of the tougher kids, you and the Hempstead kids. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I was doing a piece on the radio not long ago, uh, and I ended up recording a video about it because it was so interesting. Uh, it was it was about how to find your purpose in life, and you know one of my one of my good friends is is uh, uh, Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren, who wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, and and you know, we have found that a lot of our listeners, and certainly coming out of COVID, people are are trying to find their 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 purpose, their 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 second chapter in their life, right? And so there is a there's actually a book. It's called uh, The Rule of Ten Years Old, and it's very simply this: If you're looking for your purpose in life, if you're looking what uh, the purpose that, the, uh, for which God made you, look back to when you were ten years old. What were you doing? What lit you up? What were you passionate about? What were you doing? You know, other than a lemonade stand uh, that, that you would have done if you if you couldn't make money doing it. And for me, I was a lot like you. And you were running around with tape recorder, interviewing people. I was uh, I had one of those you know finished basements on Long Island that my dad had created, and so there was a reel to reel tape recorder in there. There was a Magnus cord organ from from Corvette. If anybody remembers yeah. Corvette, I, know <laughs> I you, have one of those too. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, and and you know and and then there was a Mister Microphone from Sears. Yes. This is back when you, know, yeah. you could buy everything at Sears. Yeah. You know, Ron Copeil, right? <laughs> one store for everything. <laughs> for everything, and so. Um, because I was, I wasn't an only child, but I had two sisters. One was 10 years and the other one was 12 years older than me. And so I was really left alone. And, 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 you know, and many of the kids and even Lin-Manuel Miranda talks about this, you know, the, the, uh, the creator of Hamilton, I was a latchkey kid, you know, I came home from school and I was just left alone in, 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 in the basement. <laughs> so like, I was like, you know, I was like a troll in there, uh, you know, cre creating stuff. And since I was re a really, really skinny kid. Uh, and not not popular at all in, at Garden City High. Um, there was just a lot of time to do other stuff, and most of that was just you know. And I was so skinny that I, I couldn't play. The only sport I could play was, was soccer because I couldn't get insured to play fo you know football. And so uh, there was uh, there was a lot of music, right? And and my mom, what like you mentioned, she was a surgical nurse. She was a real taskmaster, and so every one of her kids, me and Mary Ellen and Bonnie, we all played instruments. Uh, Mary Ellen and I played piano and Bonnie played the cello, but we had, uh, for, for a couple of years, I had a teacher that, who, who had worked at the, uh, the Juilliard school. And so she, <laughs> Ms. Andriani, like she, she taught me the way they taught at the, at the Juilliard school. And it was, it was just a lot of classical music, a lot of practice. And then I was in the band playing, playing trumpet, uh, in the marching band because I, because I wasn't a sports hero. And so, uh, and so there was a lot of, it just, isn't it funny, you know, when you leave, I mean, you may have had the same experience, Jim, but when I left Garden City and went to college, first of all, the first two years were really easy for me because the school system was so great on, on, in most of Long Island. And the other thing is Garden City, even to this day, was more like a performing arts school. You know, there was just so many opportunities to, to, be, to, be, to be in theater and to be in, in like five different bands uh, and everybody on Long Island back in the day, I was born in 1952. Everybody was was in a garage band, right? And, yeah, and so sure. I ended up in a in a band called the Best of Both Worlds, where two bands had broken up, and we ended up being sort of a, a blood blood sweat and tears uh, cover band. Uh, and and we would uh, Billy Joel was in a band called the Hassles, mm -hmm. and so we were sort of rival rival bands. We we were like, well, it was like if if Billy didn't want the gig, then we got it. So he was mm -hmm. like Coca Cola, and we were not even Pepsi; we were RC Cola. <laughs> <laughs> higher is root beer. <laughs> oh no! Come on, higher is root beer. Right, right up under, That's under even under higher. Under root beer. Once you once you have the root beer float, higher is gets much uh, much higher. Than <laughs> Remember the guy that used to come to repair the uh, television tubes when the TV would blow out. The TV guy would come and I remember replaced. that guy. I remember I remember the knife sharpening guy. I knife remember the brush man. I remember all, all the brush. Guys, yeah. 
Yeah. We had the diaper truck too. I don't know if you had that. It was a t- <laughs> Yeah, those I mean, those were really the days, you know, where there was um not to do the old man thing, but uh where there was one phone, you know, in our our house there was one phone. It was a wall phone. And, and in it the had kitchen a, had a, a, a curly cord that was like 30 feet long so that yeah. the teenagers could go into a closet right. somewhere and have a conversation. Was it on the kitchen wall in the kitchen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's, laughs> and the, uh, well, it's interesting because my uh, brother-in-law said to my mother once, uh, they had since sold the house and then they built a home in uh, Florida, folks. Um, but my, when my brother-in-law came into the family. He said to my folks, he said, how come you still have the same telephone number and the same phone on the wall and my mother's like everybody knows this number why would we change it and it's the same number they had for decades and hey if it works (laughs) (laughs) so interesting story as far as how you ended up making your way to wcbs tv channel 2 in new york with uh you know the jim jensen's and all the rest how did that all happen and uh you were terrific as a reporter, John. I I, I appreciate it. I was uh, I was learning on the go, and you know it's 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 wild. You know, like just uh, ten days ago or so, uh, I was on a Zoom call with my my old friend John Stossel. A lot of people. Oh remember, yes, who, remember John see. Stossel? Who yeah. was? We, we were we were all cub reporters at the same time. It was me and me and Stossel, uh, Meredith Vieira, uh, Linda yeah. Ellerby. You know, Brian Williams ended up coming in after us, and also Bill O'Reilly. It was it was really a proving ground for, for reporters. Right, before, you know, a lot of people went to sixty Minutes, including Meredith, and and Bill O'Reilly, uh, for a time. And then uh, John Rick is his real name, Rick Stossel. He went to um, he went to twenty twenty. And the reason I was on the phone with him was because our good friend Arnold Diaz yeah, uh, just passed, passed away. He, yes. he had a long a long fight with uh, uh, multiple myeloma, and yes. Uh, uh, he's a he was i mean he had this guy had 48 emmys uh you know shame on uh, you that whole branding yeah, exactly. of he catching was, people in the act yeah yeah those were really the halcyon days of uh, of local news gathering and and how i ended up in there at 23 years old as a correspondent was it's just it's insane because i i was a musician right and that's i consider myself a musician and i i um my father, uh, uh, who was World War II veteran, tough guy, he was the vice president of the underwear division of Haynes. <laughs> so we, we got free underwear for most of my life. Did you? <laughs> and uh, and he um, he decided that, and uh, you know, back in the day, people were like this. I mean, parents were like this. Like, hey, listen, you're not going to go to a music school because you're, you'll starve to death. And, and I, 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 I've already enrolled you early decision at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Uh, we're going to, they were originally from North Carolina. We're going to move back to North Carolina, uh, mom and I, and, and we'll get in-state tuition for you and you'll study textile chemistry. And then there'll be a a job waiting for you at Haynes when you're, you know, when you're done. And so he had the whole thing planned out. I was like, well, I, 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 what was I going to say? Um, okay. Uh, You don't go up against your parents, not back then anyway. And so, I went to state and I lasted in textile chemistry. I, yeah, you mentioned physics, chemistry, quantitative analysis, organic chemistry, statistics, you know, all of that stuff. And I lasted about uh, two and a half years. And uh, finally, it was just, I just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And, and, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then my friend, Steve Thomas, he suggested that we take television radio 101 yeah. uh, as he said, Hey, it's an easy A, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm in, you know? And I, so we, I took the course and, and it was in, you know, this feeling, it was in the first mm. 45 seconds that I got bit yeah. with the bug so badly yeah. Yeah. that I stopped going to all the rest of my, my courses, to, uh, my classes and just, just made videos you know yeah. and just learned how to be on camera it just it was and so my my gpa started going down and and so i i, I tried to drop some courses and i went to my statistics professor and we were past the drop ad date you know in, the, in that one semester and and i said I, I, hey listen my other professors have let me drop these courses i'd like to drop this course and he said no you can't mm. i want you to stick it out you know you've got mm-hmm. you got a high c yeah. And uh, you should stick it out, you know, and, and plus I want to follow university rules. You're past the drop ad date. And so I was distraught. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I, I had to wait it out another, another full semester. And 
Uh, and so I went back to my fraternity house at, at Lambda Chi, and uh, and one of my fraternity brothers, who shall remain nameless, uh, said to me, uh, uh, "Oh, what? You, this is crazy." After I told him the story about my my professor, he said, "Just do what I do." And I said, "Well, what's that?" And he said, "You just uh, you, you just write your professor's name on the drop ad card." And I said, "Well, that's that's forgery." And he's like, "Ah, forgery? What? <laughs> Never mind." So, uh, and I may have had a beer. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I wrote my <laughs> professor's name on the drop ad card, and uh, and 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 it worked, right? Yeah. And so, at the end mm -hmm. of the semester, then I went I went home to my parents, and um, and my report card was was going to come like the next week, but the report card never came. And what happened was a letter came to my dad, and the dad was from the chancellor of NC State University. I was just back there not long ago, and they all remember this story. And uh, he said, you know, I'd broken the honor code. I was being um, thrown out of school, uh, suspended indefinitely. I could appeal it if I wanted. And uh, I was given, given an F for the course because the, the professor, you know, turned me in. And so I got thrown out of school, and then within 24 hours, my dad had thrown me out of the house saying uh you have you have shamed uh me you've shamed your mom you've shamed your mom's bridge club you've shamed our church you've shamed the underwear division of haynes he just kept going you know uh, even the philip brush man was humiliated <laughs> <laughs> he didn't come anymore nobody he sharpened stopped. our knives that's no, it, it was over done it was, i ruined the whole neighborhood and uh <laughs> And so I didn't know what else to do. And I got in my fastback Mustang, which I it bought, you know, from summer jobs, from cutting yards. And I drove back to state because I didn't know any, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go make it all the way back to Garden City. I didn't have enough gas money. And so I, I had a pup tent from, from Boy Scouts and I pitched the pup tent in, in the park uh, right there near Raleigh. And I worked construction, pumped gas, and I, and I waited tables, uh, at bus tables. I wasn't even a waiter. And uh, I went to ra radio stations and, and tried to get a job because they'd had some training in the in, in that course. They said, well, you don't have any on-air abilities, you know, no experience, so we can't hire you. But then this one guy named Scott White at, at WKIX, which was the Rick D station at the time, WKIX, he felt sorry for me. And he said, he said listen, why don't, you, why don't you do a utility around here? You take the trash out, do, uh, erase the tapes, do that stuff. And and uh, and maybe you know something might 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 happen because he felt sorry for me, and that's what I did. And then I was always I was practicing on the weekends. You know, we I would do this thing. My friend Bill Leslie, who he became my friend, who was on the air. He, I, I watched his his technique. He would take the newspaper, you know, you know the Raleigh News and Observer, and he would he would read a story and then he'd put it down and then he would ad lib it to to the mirror to the bathroom mirror. So I started, I started doing that and I was imitating, you know, other broadcasters that I heard, uh, you know, on the, on the radio. And what happened, if you stick it out, right, what happened was yeah. uh, one of the, one of the uh, weekend guys, the weekend news guys left abruptly and took a job in, uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I was the only guy, I was the only guy that was, uh, that was available. And they, so they there. put me on the air and I did like one show and they said, well, Hey, why don't you do, you know, why don't you do next week? And, and, uh, and so, uh, people kept leaving, <laughs> I kept getting advanced. And then I got a job at the local television station, uh, developing the news film back when you had developed news film. And so I started sending out, sending out, uh, audition tapes, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I was in Raleigh making $125 anchoring the news. And so I kept my, I kept my, uh, uh, my busing job at the deli at, in Cameron village. And so. I would I, I would get off the news and then I would go to the deli and I would bust tables and people would be there. Would they see be, you there? I'd start cleaning up the table. Be, Aren't you on the news? I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So That's I sent a tape to Orlando yeah. and then to Nashville where I worked with Oprah and um, yeah. and, and Pat Sajak. And then I did some. I, I did a report in Nashville where I got the um, uh, the fire codes chain. It's a long story, but if I got, yeah. I got the the story documentary that I did got the fire codes changed in Nashville and got the uh, the fire um, fire marshal fired for for corruption, and the guys at CBS in New York saw that, and they offered me a job, and I showed up there 23 years old, and I was in Stossel, and Chris Borgen, if you remember that name, Chris Borgen, and Jerry yeah. Nackman, uh, yeah. and JJ Gonzalez, JJ, and yes. Dick Parrish, all these guys from JJ from Parrish. Channel Two, they just wrapped their arms around me, and and yeah. and 
with Karamee. Rollin Smith and Michelle Marsh. Yeah. yeah. And- I, in fact, I, I just played a concert recently and Rollin showed up and he uh, looks exactly the same. He looks, still looks like. Doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that was a, it was, it was like, I don't, I, have, I still don't know how I got there. You know, uh, what's his name? Ed Joyce, the news director must have seen yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and then. And also Marilyn there. Salinger too, right? Marilyn Salinger and I anchored the weekend show. In fact, yes. I did. I, I did Michelle Marsh and 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 Mr. G, the weatherman. I did G, their, yeah. their auditions for both of them. He's still doing the weather on WPIX Channel Eleven. Still that's amazing, that's amazing. on the yeah, air. You know, New York is a is a tremendous way, a tremendous place to learn how to be a journalist. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. You also got a chance to get involved with uh, NBC as well and sports casting, sports reporting as well. That was yeah, really sport, cool. The, Olympics. The was, that was a little, that was, that was insane. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Like most of my life because I got a call from Terry O'Neill uh, in, after I was at uh, CBS for about six, seven years. And, and uh, he was at uh, CBS network of sports. And he said, we'd like to offer you a job doing sports. And I said, I can't name three NFL teams or, <laughs> and five uh NBA basketball teams and he goes no this is not that's not what we've seen you do your we've seen your live reporting what we'd like you to do is be a live sports reporter and also do uh do um uh play by play of of sporting of the anthology sporting events is what they call them so gymnastics uh, uh, uh bicycle racing downhill skiing all the rest of that stuff and that's really where my professional music career mm-hmm. began because David Michaels Al Michaels brother uh, David Michaels was a producer and he was assigned to the Tour de France. And he, so he said, it's so always I. So he said, I want to do this MTV style. And I said, well, I actually have a, you know, a, a, a bedroom full of, of synthesizers in my apartment. Why don't we just bring them and I'll write the music for it? And he said, he said, okay, but we can't pay you. I said, don't worry about it. And so that's really how I got started scoring, uh, scoring the picture. That's extraordinary, huh? That opportunity. Gee, how did yeah, he enter- it's, you know, you, you know yeah. a lot of it is just it is just, just saying yes, you know, saying yes, saying yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and being there at the right time, and uh, oh, for, sure. for sure, yeah, a lot of that. Uh, yeah. But one of the things too uh, is that you had an opportunity. You re- wrote the NBA on NBC basketball theme, Round Ball Rock, which I think was really incredible. Uh, how did that opportunity come your way? Well, I was what? writing. I was known, at, at least in 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 the network sports world, for for being a writer, an announcer, yeah. and and also writing sports music. Um, yeah. And, when, what, and what I would do is, because because I was inside, right? I knew when when the producers were looking for a theme, if, for anything from uh, golf to uh, the Ironman triathlon. And so I would I would just hunker down in my basement and write like two hours worth of music, or write or write themes and just present it to them on a reel to reel tape, and they because uh, they didn't have a budget for it right, there was no you know uh, Spotify there was no downloading music and paying for the for the for for music or streaming or any of that stuff of course, but uh, I would just, I would give them the music for free. But then I would give them the you know my publishing and my writing credit, and they would put that in. in uh, they would they would enter that into the into the uh, BMI royalty world, and so uh, I was making those those uh, royalties on the songs that they were playing. And some of the songs were playing like hundreds and hundreds of times, mm-hmm. especially on, yeah. the, on the tour de France. So it was it was a it was a living basically. And then I when I was doing the um, I was doing the tour de France. I was in Megève, France. And, and I heard through the grapevine that NBC had taken the, uh, the coverage, the NBA coverage away from uh, the rights, away from CBS, and they were looking for a new theme. And so, you know, in the middle of the night, I'm thinking, what would that theme sound like? What would it be? I, I wanted to be able to submit something, right? I they, was, they, they didn't ask me to submit. I just knew that I could submit, and I knew that they were looking for one, and they were looking at composers. And so uh, I had this theme in my head in the middle of the night in France, and I didn't have a tape recorder with me at the time. I didn't have a keyboard. I didn't have manuscript paper. And I, and I knew that if I, and I tell this story on stage all the time, people are always yeah. laughing. I knew that <laughs> if I didn't get it out of my head, 
that it would be gone forever. You know that feeling. You have something yes. in the middle of the night. And so, yeah. so at 2 o'clock in the morning, I called my answering machine in Manhattan and left a message for myself on my answering machine. And the message was, you know, and I went back to hung up, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. I, I didn't remember any of it. But when I got home two weeks later, it was on my answering machine. And uh, this piano is not hooked up, but it was uh, it was on my answering machine, and um, uh, I so I played it, and I put it, I put it on the, uh, I put it on the piano, and it was uh, put the answering machine on the piano, and played played the thing back. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, and and so I had like there's a second part of it, you know, was a trying to play piano backwards this is amazing yeah <laughs> and i so, remember that uh, so I well had, john i had a, <laughs> i had a i had a piece of it right yeah and uh, so i figured it out i recorded it and then i thought you know why don't i add some strings to it so i hired us uh you know like 10 string players to play it on there and then uh i was going to send a cassette to to Dick Eversaw, the president of, of NBC Sports, because uh, through the grapevine, I knew how to get to him. And I thought, you know, why don't I just why don't I just take all of the doubt out of this for these guys? And so I recorded a night of basketball, and it was when the Lakers were playing the Celtics, right? And I recorded that on my Betamax. I took it into in editing, because uh, you couldn't edit by yourself, right? I took it into an editing suite, mm -hmm. and I edited fast breaks together. And I then I took my song and I put the song underneath the fast breaks. And and it, it what happened with it, the song uh, appeared to be slow, right? Because the fast breaks were faster. So the fast breaks were at 131 beats a minute, like like that, you know. And the song was slower than that. So I went back and lifted the tempo of the song. Then I came back into the editing suite and married it to the video. So I sent Ebersol and those guys at NBC, I sent them a VHS tape. So what they saw was this theme with, with the footage that they were going to be putting on the air. And Ebersol called me a week later and said, you know, this is perfect. Uh, we'll just use this. You know, so it, um, it was, it, I think just, just understanding how those people, those people, how those people yeah. think. Yeah. Right. was the reason that, that theme got on the air. Which is absolutely incredible. Um, and people still remember it uh, today. We even have a comment in here from Austin Field. I absolutely love the NBA on NBC theme. I still listen to that theme today. Best theme ever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thanks, they're, Austin they're, Field. Kids, they're, kids, they're kids that have learned how to, how to play it. Which is incredible. How did yeah. it come about uh, with all this experience that was rolling where Entertainment Tonight started knocking on your door, John. Well, it was a, it, it was really, I mean, I call it a Holy Spirit moment all my whole career, really, where yeah. um, uh, the the management had changed at CBS Sports when I was there, and they yeah. were going they were going away from these anthology events. They weren't going to do any more Iron Man. They weren't going to do any more Tour de France. Uh, they weren't going to cover gymnastics. They wanted to. They wanted to purchase more of the bigger sports, the rights, uh, baseball, basketball, all of that. And so uh, the the new the new president of of uh, CBS Sports called me into his office and he said, "Hey, listen, we think you're you're really really talented, but I want to give you haven't you have another eight months left in your contract, but I I want you to know that we're not going to renew your contract. So I didn't want it to be a surprise to you if there's you know anything else that comes along." Then, then you should probably probably take it. And I, was, of course, was crushed because I was having such you know such a good time. And but at the same time, I had received a phone call while I was in in France months ago from uh, a, a guy from Paramount Television. Frank Kelly was his name. I was trying to recall his name, and uh, he left a message saying, "Call me. Uh, I want to talk to you about a about a uh, hosting job." And I didn't even know what it was, right? And so. Uh, after that conversation with the with the CBS president, I I called him at Paramount and he talked to me. He said, "Hey, listen, um, I work for uh, I just launched a show called Entertainment Tonight, and uh, Mary Hart is the is the host, and we're looking for uh, a newsier approach to the show. And we found a tape of yours anchoring the news with 
with Pat Sajak from, from Nashville, would you be interested in doing an, an audition? And I said, I said, yeah, why not? So, well, Mary's going to be in town at the Gulf and Western building. And why don't you show up and, and, and you guys can have a conversation on camera. And, and so uh, I showed up and I was still like loud and doing sports. And Mary was just like, oh, this is just, you know, we, we, we talked later about how she, she told the people at Paramount, this, this is never going to work. And, um, and so I did like two or three more auditions and, and they offered me a job, but the job they offered me was absolutely no guarantee. It was like, we'll try it for 13 weeks. You fly out to California and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try you out for 13 weeks. I, I didn't have anything else I could do. So, so I left, uh, went there and it, it, it worked out. Mary and I, Mary and I clicked, I went from a 13 week contract to a three year contract and, and they, in the, in the second contract, they agreed to let me uh, be off at one o'clock in the afternoon and use their recording studio facilities at Paramount. And, and so that's when I started working on, on films and television shows. And it was, they were just, even to this day, they're, they're so sweet to me. I mean, if I have an album that comes out or whatever, they, yeah. they, they pull me in there and, and help me promote it. I think I remember too, uh, when I interviewed you way back when you had that PBS fabulous concert at Red Rocks, you were mentioning how uh, you had the television, but then you also had music and music was really tugging at your heart and tugging at your time. And you almost had to come to a point of making a decision you know, do I stay kind of with the television side of things like an entertainment tonight, things of that nature, or do I really go full on into the music and the music sort of won over for you, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, um, I could have stayed with, uh, with television, you know, for, for a while. In fact, I had this conversation with, cause I was married at the time when, when Red Rocks, I mean, the reason Red Rocks happened was because, uh, Connie, uh, my wife, Connie Selica, uh, uh, you know, invested in it, uh, invested in my music and she, she always has. And so, uh, when that blew up, it was, I really just wanted to, and it, there was a little bit of hubris going on, you know, I, I, I always wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And so I wanted to burn my boats and, and even the guys at Paramount television, I mean, they sued me and uh, it, I, I broke my contract and they sued me. And then, and then we we made up and and I worked out a, a, a little bit more of my contract, but I just wanted to put television behind me, and uh, and 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 music uh, you know supported us for for years, and so uh, I didn't have to do that. Probably probably should have done it a little differently, and, and I write about that in my, in my book, but I did. I, I really wanted to prove that. Uh, I, and you know, at that point, my dad had passed away. Both my parents. Uh, and I'd always wanted to prove to my dad that I could make it as a full-time musician. And, and so that's, that was also in my head. And you've done such an incredible job. Like I told everybody, uh, you got to get his music if, if from pop to contemporary Christian classical. You've, you weave so many incredible melodies into your repertoire. It's really fantastic stuff. My friend, how did, uh, how did intelligence for your life, how did the John Tesh radio show first come your way? Which again, I, I think could be even more now, but I think the last count was something like 400 stations syndicated, yeah. which is yeah. incredible. And you're on with these incredible nuggets about life. And you just, it's sort of, you've got this really cool ability to make people feel good, lower their blood pressure, get them thinking about what matters in life. And I think it's an extraordinary thing that you've created, John, as a broadcaster, but also as a guy who understands what life's really all about. I, I think that I appreciate that. Uh, I, it was it was another one of those things where I mean, just like you know, when all the record companies told me no, uh, we're not interested in signing you, and and I found a way around it, you know, pivoted and, and found the, found my way through through PBS. It. When, when I'd been out on the road for several years doing 50, 50 concerts a, a year and on the road for sometimes, sometimes three months without getting back home, you know, my, my daughter was an infant and I just left my wife and my daughter alone to fend from the, for themselves. And I realized that it just wasn't going to work. And so uh, I, I wanted to find a way to, to make a living doing with something I loved. And then also, 
just dial the concerts back. And, and even to this day, we still do 15 or 20 shows every year. Uh, but, but I looked at the radio landscape and, and, I, and I thought, I don't want to do a countdown show. I wouldn't be good at that. I don't want to do a love song at, 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 at night. I don't have, and somebody's already doing that. Delilah was doing that. Uh, and then I read this book by Jack Trout called Differentiate or Die. And it was, you know, if you want to find your way into a legacy business, which radio was, it was a very mature business, you have to find something that's that, that's different. And I wasn't going to be a shock jock, right? Uh, so uh, I I went and uh, I, I subscribed to all these um, uh, newsletters. And, and I started looking at these newsletters and it was all these tidbits of, of it was curation, right? It was the, the newsletters were taking, these were newsletters that you, that you paid for. And they were taking like 5,000 word stories, 10,000 word stories in magazines, and they were condensing them into 400 words. And I thought, you know, I could probably do that on the radio. So I took it to Westwood One and to iHeart. Uh, it was called Clear Channel back in the, back in the day, yeah, as right. you know. Um, yeah. And I took it to them. And they said, no, you, you can't do a radio show with 10 researchers. It's too expensive. And so again, we just, you know, Connie and I, we just bootstrapped it. And, and we, we, we said, I, I said, I really believe in this. I really think this could work. I think that people, this was in the nascency of the, of the internet where there was so much information out there and nobody could figure out which, what was good, especially health information. They couldn't figure out what, uh, okay, so is this real? Is this, is this going to kill me? And so we became curators and we started with six stations and we just gave the show away for free. Uh, but it, you know, as you know, in the world of scaling, it costs the same amount to do six stations as it does to take to do 600. And so we, we deficit finance that and actually use the money we've made on music and music publishing to start the radio show. And then we, we just say, Hey, you can have it for free. Just call your friends at the other radio stations if you like it, you know? And so people started calling in saying, saying, Oh Matt, I loved intelligence for your life. I, you know, here's the tidbit I used. I used it to do this and do that. And so we've been doing it for, you know, more than 25 years. And, uh, it's a lot of work. It's not yeah. just show up and, yeah, and ad lib. No. It's, you know, yeah. there's a lot of curation that goes on, but it's you been forced tell. learning yeah. for me and for Connie. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell that there's a lot of thought that goes into it as well. And I'm sure the feedback you get from the listeners is pretty extraordinary and probably touches you in deep ways. Huh? Sometimes when you do it, you don't realize the people that you reach through television, radio, music, and then you hear yeah. from people who write in and contact you, how they look forward to it and how it enhances and enriches their life. Yeah, we get it. We get a good reaction. You know, what happened to me was, um, was in, and, 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 and it's, it's, it really has become a, a family where people, uh, especially when, once Facebook happened, when they launched Facebook and people were able to actually reach you that way, instead of calling up on, you know, calling in the, the, the studio, the radio studio. But when I was in 2015, when I was diagnosed with a, a very rare form of, of cancer and, uh, and the doctor told Connie and I to get my affairs in order and, and they gave me 18 months to two years to live. That's when people really started digging in and praying for me. And, and, uh, and it was a, it was a, it was a rough time for five years, really, on and off. Fortunately, I never lost my voice, and so I, when I was going through chemo, I'd be on my back <laughs> doing the radio show. Yeah. But it caused we 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 relied on a newfound uh, intelligence in in what what prayers and what the Bible said about about healing and health. And so we were using prayers like Mark eleven twenty three scriptures, and also. Uh, uh, Proverbs eighteen twenty one, death and life are in the power of the tongue, uh, and and we were using that plus the modality of of medicine to help get me healed. And and I you know, I I mean to this day I have far outlived what what uh, what they had predicted for me obviously. And and so during that journey, learning those prayers, learning how to pray, learning how to visualize health and healing, um, I built over the last two years. I built this this online course because people are always ask me how can you you know can you tell me what you did and so i actually built a course called um, the secrets to answered prayers and and we actually just like two days ago launched this thing it's on my website at tesh.com but it it's 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 like a 45 minute thing where you can get inside what my journey was and understand what connie and i did and 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 how we how we blended the modalities of of 
of, of spirituality, of, of prayer, of the, of, of the scriptures that were in the Bible with medicine to, to come out with a, with, with a, a positive result. And, and so, uh, I've really enjoyed talking about that and I'm enjoying it now, obviously, because it's a, it's a way for me to actually share my testimony. That's so beautiful. You know, uh, again, has faith always been a part of your life growing up, even back home on the island? Were you surrounded by faith? Was it something that you always turned to in the, the crazy, frustrating, confusing times of life? Or did that get enhanced and enriched through Connie and just through yeah. living? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you nailed it. I mean, it, it got, it, it got enhanced and enriched to use your words. Um, when I met her, when I met her 32 years, more than 32 years ago. And, and I, I grew up in the Methodist church in, in, in Westbury, Westbury Methodist church. And it was, but I was just doing, you know, I was, I was checking the box, you know, because my parents wanted me to go to church and I didn't really have a relationship with God. Uh, but, uh, when, when the two of us met, uh, she was a born again Christian, and and so she she basically said, "Well, listen, if you want to if you want to be with me on Sundays, you're going to have to meet me at church." <laughs> and it was great. It was yeah. that was her ministry was because uh, she knew that I I I needed a I need I needed a deeper relationship with God, and so we 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 uh, we made God a, a huge part of our marriage uh, before we were married and after we were married and with with our you know with our families, and so when this challenge life threatening challenge terminal cancer diagnosis when yeah. when this life challenge came came on i had to rely on her because i was i was sick from the treatment i was really sick and i was in a lot of pain and so she was the one that was laying hands on me and praying over me and she was the one that had other people praying and she was the one that was protecting me from anybody speaking words of uh, of sickness or or death over me you know um and yeah. there wasn't a word of doubt in our family because uh, because of her because she just you know she just she stood up for me and so yeah. when when you get on the other side of something like that you truly yeah. understand what the true nature of god is you know when i first heard that news i was completely shocked because you've always you know and you never know what's going on inside and of course, stress and everything, all the th things that we come across, but you've always seemed so uh, physically fit and healthy and conscious of, you know, what to eat. And you just, what right. I said, come on, John Tesh, <laughs> it just, it didn't compute, but right. I think, right. um, you know, it's, it was a, it's a wake up call for everybody that uh, anything had happened. And when you get the signs, you get indications, go get checked. Make sure yeah. that you stay on top right. of it. How right. are you today? I'm good. I'm good today. I'm, Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I consider myself uh, healed. I'm the, sort of the, the poster boy of MD Anderson for uh, for good patients. Uh, but uh, I, but I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I you know, listen. I worked hard and I suffered and and you know and all of that yeah. through the through the whole thing. But there's nothing that gives me uh, more pleasure than than to actually lionize my my wife who. I mean, it's very easy for me to say. It sounds like it sounds hyperbolic, but it's very easy for me to say that without Connie, I would have died. Because I, when when I got that diagnosis, I started drinking. I started because I was in so much yeah, pain. Yeah. I started taking Vicodin. You know, mixing right. alcohol and Vicodin is not something I right. <laughs> recommend. Right. And I was, I just became a cancer patient. I was done. I was finished. You know, sixty three, and I said, I've done some stuff. I wrote the NBA basketball theme. <laughs> Now right. I can die, you know, and right. it was, uh, uh, she was just like, no, I, this is, this is, this is not us. This is not happening. And not, not yet. Uh, no. you, need, you, you need to, you need to be a man and buck up here because, uh, you're being selfish right now. And she was right. She was right. And that's what, that's what got me through it. What are some things you learned about yourself during that process when you really had this time to look within a lot of the world that we're in is so external that this is a uh, self moment looking within what did what are a few things john tesh learned about john tesh? um that uh that part of life is 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 suffering that that you you have to understand that there's going to be uh suffering in your in your life it might not be as bad as anything i went through it might be it might be worse i i read jim i i must have read 
Viktor Frankl's uh, book, Man's Search for Meaning, like 10 times uh, during that whole, you know, five year, six year period. Uh, he was a Holocaust survivor who, who just really uh, put on paper what, what it means to, to suffer and to, and to get on the other side of it. And so I, I, I guess, I guess what I could say is that I've, I learned how to be, how to be grateful. And, uh, and I learned, how, I've learned how to be empathetic. And, you know, when your paradigm shifts from, from healthy person who's in the gym every day, who's got his life ahead of him, when your paradigm shifts to cancer patients, then you're able to see everybody else's paradigm, you know, and, and you're, when I was at MD Anderson and I would have, and I wrote about this in the book and I'd have a, you know, I'd had like two lines of chemo in my left arm. I'd be sitting there feeling sorry for myself. And then these two bald headed kids, 12 year olds would walk by with 10 lines in their arms, you know? And so there's, there, there are always, there's always a new paradigm around the corner that, that can make you feel grateful about what you're in right now. So gratefulness, I would say is, is, is the simple answer. It's a beautiful one. And that's the book relentless, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I I recommend the book. I mean, it sounds weird for me to say it that way, but uh, yeah, listen. Sure. Like, I I would advise people to listen to it on Audible because I'm re I'm reading it, and you can, I think you can really get a feeling for because we we titrate the cancer journey through through my journey as a as a professional, and and I, and I think that when you hear the book, especially, it'll be, I I think I I think I can do what this guy did. You know, I think I can do that because because when, even when you see me on stage, you know, during this Christmas tour, you know, it's 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 not like well, it's oh, it's Billy Joel. You know, I, you can see you can see it's not it's me. <laughs> you know, and you can see, uh, you know, husbands and wives or whatever, you know, leaning over you can, the husband leaning over. You know, with a couple of lessons, I I could absolutely do this. You know, right. Exactly. What was that writing process like? Writing that book and being so open and expressive. It was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> no, it was, they wanted the book in six months and, and it took me two and a half years. And I, I lived a whole lifetime in two and a half years. It was, it, it, it's right there in the, it's right there in the, in the book. There's, yeah. yeah That's so, so cool. Yeah. It's hard. It's yeah, hard to do. It, it's gotta be too. Well, you also did uh, intelligence for your life prior to New York times bestseller. That was easier because that was just a lot of the tidbits from the, from the radio show. And there's a little bit of my, my life in there, but, uh, but relentless is a, is, you know, is, yeah. is, is a chance to, to really get inside. Uh, yeah, well, it's m my life. If you want, <laughs> if you want to get in there, it's, it's yeah. in there. Which is, uh, I think, fantastic. Uh, you also have done intelligence for your life with Connie and Gibb as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Connie does a, the health version of the show, which is great. It, she's, she's the one that's interviewing all the high level experts as it should be because we actually phoned up a lot of those experts when uh when i was going through going through treatment anyway i wanted to uh I, I, I'd, i've taken up so much of your time i wanted to thank you uh, for, you were amazing uh, to, tell us about the therapy. christmas concert that's, that's coming out too so yeah people, we, you know yeah. i'm an old school guy you know yes. so uh, obviously it's just like you so this yeah. is an old school christmas basically can't wait it's, we're gonna be there yeah, and you, uh, it's 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 you know it's a, a big band arrangements of uh, of Christmas tunes and and uh, if uh, if folks want to check it out, you can go you can go to my website at tesh com. Check out the website, folks, because in addition to the opportunity to get tickets to the Christmas concert, also his website is rich with great information. And again, like you said, the online courses and everything is, is very enriching. The books, all the music you can find, of course, the books everywhere. Books are sold and Amazon, the music, Spotify, iTunes. Load it up, folks. You're going to feel real good listening to John's music. John, you know, this really was terrific catching up with you since we were at PBS together. And I have been hoping to do this for a while. And then when I saw that the Christmas concert was coming and you're coming here to back home to the East Coast and you're going to be making your mark here. We've already got the tickets. We're going to see you there, root you on. It really was an honor and a pleasure to have you here. And I hope whatever we've done here, the show uh, which has a positive bent to it as well met your expectations and you enjoy the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you, my friend. Great. Thank you. It's my pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. We'll see you again real soon and right, best of luck with the tour, John. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you. You're welcome back anytime. You take care. Cheers.
John Tesh, the incomparable, here on the Jim Masters Show, live entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series. Folks, I do encourage you to go to Tesh.com to get uh, all the information about the upcoming Christmas tour he has. We're going to go and we're going to check it all out. We already got our tickets actually secured about a week ago. And um, yeah, what a great guy, right? He's so open, so real. Uh, this is rare. He usually doesn't do this. Uh, you don't see him a lot doing this kind of thing. Um, but again, when we had chatted, I said, you know, I would love to have you come on the Gym Master Show live. First of all, we can catch up on so much since he and I saw each other last, which was way back when he had that incredible concert on PBS live from Red Rocks, and I interviewed him there. But also to tap into his uh, his career, of course, you know, growing up in New York. And uh, he grew up in Garden City, and uh, that Garden City is on Long Island. And I was born in Mineola, but we grew up further out east, eastern Long Island, which was wonderful. And uh, similar stories, too, which was really amazing. He's a great guy. And as I said, a multi-talented person from writing themes for television news anchoring and reporting, uh, composing and arranging music. And, you know, he's just really incredible. Of course, many of you remember him from Entertainment Tonight with Mary Hart. Incredible story he shared with that. His uh, beginnings on uh, television, uh, Channel 2 in New York, WCBS TV, time reporting for NBC and the radio show, how that came about. And his book, of course, Relentless which is available uh, at Amazon. You know, you can also check out Tesh.com to uh, find out how to get that. And of course, the Christmas tour as well. And he, what was really beautiful about this conversation, folks, he, um, he had an opportunity to really talk about Connie and uh, how Connie has been a source of strength for him and love throughout uh, all the ups and downs of, you know, living and uh, loving and experiencing life. And um, he's been very open about his cancer battle and was so happy to hear that he's cured and he's doing well. And um, again, he's been on television and radio and on stages and making the music for decades, 23 years old in New York City on WCBS Channel 2, 23 years old, and he's already in the big leagues, which is really incredible. Great guy. And um, he even played a little bit of that sports theme on NBC for us. See, the piano was right there. Very open, humble, too. He's a, he's a humble guy. So uh, you won't find him talking about himself a lot. He turns to uh, his family. He turns to faith to get him through. He really does have a very motivational, positive message that uh, he shares with everybody, not just, you know, on the radio series, but in the book. And also when he performs, the stories that he tells on stage are epic. And uh, again, this was really something. And he, uh, we really, and it, it's amazing, you know, some of the guests like John, so cognizant of, of my time and not want, wanting to take too much of my time you know, they have as much of my time as they want. We, we never rush anybody here. That's why we call them conversations as opposed to interviews here at the Gym Master Show Live. What a great episode, folks, having uh, John Tesh here. And um, really, again, you got a chance maybe to hear a little bit more about his life, maybe some things you didn't know about John, a little bit uh, deeper appreciation for the talented, heart-centric guy that he is multi-Emmy winning, Grammy nominated pianist and uh, composer and musician, award winning journalist and uh, reporter, author, and uh, husband and dad and friend right here on the Gym Master Show Live. If you enjoyed it, gang, we would love, 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 love for you to share the levity with us. Help us continue to grow and reach more people around the world. How can you do that? Give this episode a like on our YouTube channel. There's a thumbs up button right there on the YouTube channel. Click the thumbs up button. Drop a comment. If you've loved this conversation with John Tesh and me here on the Gym Master Show Live, leave a comment right underneath 
this episode on our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV. Interact with us. Uh, if you have his music, what is some of your favorite uh, John Tesh music? What are some of the things you remember about his iconic career? Did you read his book? Are you going to read his book? Uh, let us know. Are you going to go to his uh, holiday concerts coming up? Have you been to his concert? Interact with us. We're very responsive. And uh, we would love for you to do that. That would be fantastic. But when you do it, it allows our episodes and our series to be reached by more people around the world. When you like, when you comment, and when you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, which costs nothing to do. And thanks to the thousands and thousands of you who have done that. Uh, we welcome you if you're brand new to the Gym Master Show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series where we're bringing back the lost art of conversation in style. Matter of fact, let's take a look at a couple of the comments that have been coming in through our live broadcast. We're coming at you live here. We're on the East Coast in the New York area, John on the West Coast, uh, but he's gonna be uh, touring the country with his holiday concert. And we are very, very excited about that. We'll be there rooting him on, probably see him and catch up with him uh, as well. Toby in California says, love, John Tesh, Marsha Watson watching. And she says, saw John in concert uh, some years back. He was awesome. He really is. And I think that's a great, great commentary. He's fantastic. Uh, let's see. We've got comments coming in here from, we're going to scroll down. There's so many. Yeah, he's very charitable as well. You're spot on with that, Toby. Kathleen says, welcome, John. So glad you could be here. Neil Rosengarten says, hey, John. And uh, good to see you, Neil. Nice to have you here as well. Let's take a look at some more. Uh, Marcia says, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And Bessie, good to see you, Bessie. Bessie has been following me for years on television and my work on PBS and other TV stations. And you remember uh, the music on NBC, the basketball. Bessie, it's so good to see you here on the show. And uh, Austin mentioned that he loves the NBA. A on NBC theme. I remember it well as well. Yeah. And um, Maureen says in Arizona to John, wow, you beat the beast. Thanks be to God for healing you. The world still needs you. Absolutely. And Kathleen in New York saying, thank God you beat it. Talking about uh, the cancer uh, that John he beat and had someone special. Of course, Connie to uh, be there right by John Tesh's side. Timothy Larson, John is really a Renaissance man, gifted and talented in so many ways. And yeah, that's what I've been saying throughout the show. He really, good to see you, Timothy. He really is gifted and, and talented. And uh, again, I knew that uh, ever since I saw him on television, on Channel 2 and then beyond. And then I started collecting his music and uh, if you've ever heard him do covers of the pop songs, it's incredible with the instrumentation, the arrangements, but also he does uh, contemporary Christian, which is absolutely beautiful. Christmas music. We have all his Christmas CDs. He does it with a band. He does it with an orchestra. Uh, really amazing. There's, uh, there's one uh, album called Sax on the Beach, which is really good. All, you know, your favorite pop songs done instrumentally. And he does classical as well. And um, Anastasia and the Living Tales. Good to see you, Anastasia. She's very excited about the Christmas concert. Love the book and love the audio book. Fabulous. Marshall Watson, Raleigh, North Carolina, chiming in here on the Gym Master Show Live. Again, we're a very interactive broadcast here and love having you with us. I loved having John Tesh with us as well. And Marriott Hartley was with us yesterday. Incredible lineup of guests for all of you. Great show, Jim. Marsha, thank you very, very much. And Maureen says, uh, John, you are a magnificent human. Thank you for being with us this evening, praying for continued good health for you. And uh, Kathleen says, uh, thanks so much, John, for being here. This was wonderful. Say hi to your lovely wife. Welcome to our Lovety family. Anastasia says, thank you, John. Neil says, good guy. He really is. Absolutely. Uh, when I first met him, it was like 1994, 95. Yeah, that's how long, um, you know, I, I've known him. It's been since 94, 95 when he had that Red Rocks concert. And 
I interviewed her on PBS and it was terrific. I just remember those phone lines were off the charts. People were like, my God. And, you know, it was really interesting. I got tasked with my uh, one of the shows I host, which is a television news magazine series and daily radio series that comes out of New York with my co-host, Doug Llewellyn, who hosts The People's Court. And I was being sent out to Colorado to interview somebody for the professional work. I believe she was a life coach. And uh, we were, I was being sent out to Denver. And um, I asked her, you know, what do you want to film? Would you want to film in Denver? You want to film downtown? You want to film at your office? Is there a location? She asked me if we could film at Red Rocks in Colorado. I said, Red Rocks? I had not been there yet. It's so beautiful. It, acoustically, it's fantastic for concerts. But I remembered, now this is years later, just a couple of years ago, I remembered the John Tesh Red Rocks concert and how beautiful it looked and the response that was happening and interviewing him about performing at Red Rocks. And that was what convinced me to say to her, we will absolutely do Red Rocks. We'll work it out and we will do the interview at Red Rocks. And that's what we did. We actually did the stand-up interview, myself and the guest, with the outdoors with the incredible backdrop of Red Rocks all around us. And you can see Denver off in the distance. It was fantastic. But it was remembering the phenomenal John Tesh concert that triggered me to get so excited when the guests said, can we film at Red Rocks? I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> it was fantastic. Kathleen says, um, thank you, Jim. Awesome show. Awesome guest. Absolutely. And uh, Maureen says, this was a great double lovity day. We had two shows today. If you weren't with us earlier, check out the show we had earlier. Broadway producer Tom D'Angora, who is uh, working with, um, oh boy, Barry Manilow, Harmony, that new Broadway musical that's coming out. And it starts Monday. Uh, we had Tom on the show. He's one of the producers of Harmony on Broadway, which is incredible. Um, Yes, good, Kathleen. You're adding John Tesh to the list of performers you'd love to see in person. You will love it. And uh, hey, Leo is here. Leo, True Frost is here. Good to see you, Leo. We love when you're here. And of course, uh, Cora, Leo and Cora. Good to see you guys here. We love when you're here as well. He's a phenomenal writer, John Tesh, as well. You'd love to see Connie Selica on the Gym Master Show as well. That would be wonderful. Yeah, you can always give us guest suggestions, folks. We're always open to that. And uh, this was really, really sensational. If this was your first time watching the Gym Master Show live, thanks for being with us. We welcome you. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share the love and tell everybody you know about our series. Always something special and unique as we've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes well over 1,020 in just three and a half years, which is unbelievable. Thanks to John Tesh for joining us again and spending some time with us, uh, just under an hour, sharing his wit and wisdom and his authenticity and touting the incredible things that are coming up like his uh, holiday tour. So make sure you check that out. Go to Tesh.com. Very, very happy to uh, share that with you and promote uh, his incredible work. Tesh.com to see it all and hear it all. And again, he's got the online courses too. And uh, he shared with us on the show some intelligence for your life. You know, we try to do that all the time, the Gym Master Show Live as well, with some of the uh, incredible things that we do with all of you to try to pick, perk up your day and uh, inspire, motivate, and just have a good time with all of you. You know, life can be really heavy. Life can be really daunting sometimes. and like John expressed in, you know, 2015 and all of a sudden, you know, he's uh, doing his thing and he gets a cancer diagnosis. Uh, and that's something that, you know, all of us know somebody who has had that happen or another illness or other things that happen in our lives. And it's um, how we handle it. It is surrounding ourselves with love and faith and and those who really, truly care, who can guide us through at the times when things aren't going to be so great and we need, you know, a kind word. We need that levity to be showered upon us in our lives. And um, 
Yeah, and I love when I have guests that sort of incorporate that into the conversation that we have with all the laughs and all the entertainment and all the interactivity and everything we do here. I do like when we get into some of the uh, real stuff, the deep stuff with our guests, because uh, you get a chance to learn a little bit more about our guests as they open up and share unique ways that they don't normally do elsewhere. You learn a little bit more about me, your host, and uh, and probably learn a little bit more about yourself as you're sharing bits and pieces of yourself and comments and, and everywhere else. So good show. Wow. So glad uh, during this busy time for him, John Tesh was able to, to make time for us. We put this together quick. We were just chatting about this last week. We're usually booked with our guests many weeks ahead. Uh, there's actually sometimes we get at a point where there's a waiting list or like a standby line of guests that uh, watch our show. They are told about our show. They somebody has been a guest on the show and they say, you've got to go on that gym master show. You've got to experience it. And that develops sort of like a, a waiting list or a standby line. And some of the trickeries to try to maneuver you know, the dates and the times and the guests and who can be on when and uh, sort of working that around my busy schedule on TV and radio. And this worked out great. Uh, and I wanted to have John on just before his holiday concert. So uh, you guys can get into the holiday mood. It's going to be really, really cool to hear the Christmas sounds and melodies done in that cool, jazzy, big band style that he's going to be doing. It's going to be a lot of fun. We already have our tickets. I already told John, we're going to be there. We're going to see you, my friend. Uh, and I really, really, really look forward to that. So, all right, gang. Uh, that is a wrap for this episode. We love you all. As I mentioned, like, comment, subscribe, share the lovely. Tell everybody you know about our show one more time. Thanks a million to John Tesh for joining us here on the show. Yes, you know him from Entertainment Tonight. However, he's done so much more before during and continues to after in an extraordinary way. My pleasure to salute him and have him here in Lovety Hall with us on the Gym Master Show Live. Good to have you with us as well. First time watching, nice to have you with us. You've watched since the beginning. We love having you here as well. For all of us at the Gym Master Show Live, I am your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. Yes, we're gonna eat and relax now. Eat and relax. Busy day tomorrow, too, on the air. So uh, in radio and television land, and then back here at Liberty Hall with all of you, we've got an incredible guest tomorrow, Thomas J. Watson, who uh, is celebrating I Love Lucy and the Lucy Show and everything Lucille Ball, as well as Judy Garland and Betty White. He is an epic executive producer and director. He's the one that, um, if you've seen the colorized versions of I Love Lucy, especially the holiday episode, any of the colorized versions of I Love Lucy on CBS television. He's the executive producer of that. Also of the DVD releases of uh, The Lucy Show and I Love Lucy. He's written all these incredible books about uh, Lucy and loving Lucy and he's done all these speaking engagements and fan clubs and all kinds of stuff. He's, uh, he's a renowned executive producer and director, but his emphasis has been classic television in everything Lucille Ball, as well as he's incorporated um, Judy Garland and Betty White as well. So we're going to find out all about that on tomorrow's episode of our show. Check it out. That'll be 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific for those that are watching us live. See you soon, friends. Thanks for stopping by, loveities, here on the Gym Master Show Live. We'll see you again soon. Be well, take care of one another, love one another, and don't forget to love yourself. Thanks for being with us. We love you all. Cheers.